Hey everyone, what's up? How's it going? This is Finite MTG, and today I am going to be doing something a little bit different from normal. Uh, I've been playing some Modern Horizons 1 drafts in my free time here and there, uh, and I've actually had two matches against LSV recently. Um, one of them was uh, on his stream, so there's a decent chance a number of you already saw that. Um, pretty exciting match, and that's the first one we're going to be diving into here. And then the second one is a um, more recent one that we played off stream. Uh, so yeah, let's dive into this first one here. Um, I think I was 1-0 at the time. He's 2-0. Um, and yeah, it looks like I win the die roll here. And yeah, I'm going to be playing this red-green lands and graveyard deck. Um, best card in my deck, I think, is probably Crashing Footfalls. And then I have Trumpeting Herd, which is, um, I guess, the budget uh, footfalls, if you will. The common one, the popper one. And we get to lead off here with turn one suspended footfalls versus turn one forest go. Uh, and then LSV here is on some kind of Cancrix nonsense. We find a forgotten cave. Uh, we're not going to try to cycle this and, and get greedy or anything, even though it would be nice for the Marasa Behemoth. Uh, I just want to be able to cast my Trumpeting Herd on turn four and have my red mana untapped if possible. We also are getting milled here by a Cancrix, so a decent chance that the Behemoth will be turned on. Mill another Trumpeting Herd um, in Anarid. We have four <laughs> copies of Trumpeting Herd in this deck. Um, and we're just going to keep getting milled here. Let's just pop out the graveyard. One of two Magmatic Sinkholes into the bin as well. And now the Ice Hide Golem. So just mill me for a bunch. Mountain is into the bin now, so the Behemoth is going to be big. Ruination Rider is at one damage. Um, and at this point I get to just deploy the, the Trumpeting Herd. Um, opponent has a Genesis. So this is a pretty scary one for me. Genesis is a big problem. Um, we do get to put a ton of power and toughness onto the board here, which is pretty nice. I think, yeah, I lead off by cycling a Kroos and Tusker here. Um, just get my Divination value find a snow land and draw a pyrophobia uh, which is going to be nice at some point and then yeah it looks like this turn is just a ruination rider and pass and then next turn uh, at some point we get to start attacking with some rhino tokens uh, put a marasa whoops put a marasa behemoth um, into play okay so there's a winding way here and what do we get with it looks like just a cross and tusker i think not the most exciting And another Cankrix, so we are really getting milled here. Um, yeah, lots of <laughs> lots of my stuff is just going into the bin. Um, and here, yeah, we get to attack for eight. So interestingly, the uh, Ice Hide Golem is just going to jump in front of the Rhino. Looks like the plan here is just to get it back and mill me for a bunch using the Genesis, which is also going to die. We do get to play a six mana eight eight Trample. We have three lands in Graveyard now for that Ruination Rider. And just hoping that I'm going to be able to try to deal in Lethal before um, the game ends. Unfortunately for me, there's a Spore Frog. And Spore Frog uh, plus Genesis is extremely hard for my deck to beat. Um, because if you're not familiar with this combo, the way it works is pretty much you can repeatedly use Spore Frog um, thanks to Genesis to just prevent me from actually dealing any combat damage. Uh, and my deck really is only going to be able to kill with combat damage. And this means that I either need some way to disrupt the combo, like Exiling Genesis or the Spore Frog from the Graveyard, which I can't do the, either of those things, or I'm going to need some kind of instant speed removal. Uh, for instance, Magmatic Sinkhole. Um, I can use that on Spore Frog on my opponent's turn, and then uh, that's something that could allow me to, to get there. There's also a chance I could kill LSV with non-combat damage uh, because of something like Ruination Rider, though that's not very likely. And so yeah, Spore Frog here sacked before I go to combat, so I don't even have to worry about attacking with anything, which is just like marginally worse, I think, than, than letting me go to attacks and then sacking it, because uh, if I just tap all my creatures, then you know maybe there's um, a situation where you want to attack with a Rhyme Tender or something. And then yeah, we're just going to keep putting some 3-3s three into play here, down to 9 cards in Library, not great, getting milled for another 4 by a Snowland, 
and I think that Spore Frog is in hand, but one of the cards that does get milled here is super, super clutch. Um, and I think I forgot that Lava Dart was in my deck at this point, which is really funny. Um, so at this point I'm frantically turning off auto yields because uh, I'm trying to see if I can actually just string together lethal. Um, so I don't have very many cards in library. Um, I can go for a pretty huge attack here. I can Lava Dart to the Spore Frog uh, during this turn to prevent it from fogging me next turn. And then I can cast Pyrophobia on my Ruination Rider um, and hope to lethal my opponent out of nowhere. So my opponent goes for a Trumpeting Herd. So just putting some blockers into play. And I don't remember if something happens with the Rhyme Tender or not. Looks like the answer is no. Yeah, no need to uh, untap a Snow Forest and play the um, play the Spore Frog knowing that I have Lava Dart and I'm just going to be able to kill that thing. Um, so yeah, then the, the goal for me here is can I win this turn? Because uh, if not, well, I very, very easily just die. Um, Genesis gets back an Ice Hide Golem, mills me for four, and I instantly lose. So I have to go for it here. And sure enough, I do just attack with everything. It's going to make some blocks. And just to make sure that, you know, we've got all the damage um, that we can possibly deal covered here, I'm going to flashback Lava Dart, targeting my opponent, putting another land into my graveyard. And now, only then, are we going to... Um, Shoot the Ruination Rider, deal my opponent 10, um, and go to game two. All right, here we are for game number two of that first match. And we have this hand, which is not ideal, but it's a fine hand. We have a snow land for the Rhyme Tender. Uh, we can cycle the reformation if we're missing lands. Um, fortunately, we are able to find land here. And there's a Cancrix, which is going to be a problem for us. We have Rhyme Tender, um, though we don't have one of our four Trumpeting Herds, which would be really nice to follow it up. Um, we get Milled for two, goodbye Crashing Footfalls. And yeah, nothing to add to the board here, so just going to start by cycling this Reformation. Um, I'm not sure whether this card is really playable, but it's in my deck uh, in theory, because if I make it to the late game and I'm just drawing lands and not actually the gas that I need, I can just turn those lands um, into, well, either other lands or spells, you know, see what we would draw. Um, but I draw Scale up here, which is really not an amazing card in this matchup. Um, probably shouldn't be in my deck post-board, though I don't remember what all my alternatives were. Uh, we're going to get milled by a snow land and attacked here just for the two damage. Um, and opponent now has a trumpeting herd of their own. Um, and at this point, it's really not a great spot for me, but um, I end up just deciding I have to fire off this magmatic sinkhole. So looking at um, what's going on for me here, I don't really have anything I'm able to add to the board right away. If I can draw my own trumpeting herd, then I can at least block this one. Um, but there's still this the problem of this frost walla, which is uh, a 4-4 four, four in combat, pretty much. Um, and so for that reason, we're just going to use the cards that uh, were milled um, to pay for Delve, and we're just going to hang back here. And it looks like next turn we do have an 8-8 that's going to be able to come out. Uh, in the meantime, we're still getting milled here, and Winter's Rest happens. Um, and this is, again, a pretty rough spot for me, because now I have to use my other sinkhole on a 3-3, uh, we're just getting beaten down like pretty hard here slash curved out on while well, we're not adding to the board at all. I had my uh, turn 5 Marasa Behemoth lined up, uh, which would have been pretty large, but the Winter's Rest on the Rhyme Tender means suddenly I'm not going to be able to, to do that on curve like I need to. So that's why we have to spend the removal spell here, try to keep my life total high. Um, and I think, I think I just end up using the Spring Bloom Druid here. Yeah. Spring Bloom is going to put me back up to the six mana I need for that Marasa Behemoth, and the opponent has a Genesis. So they don't even really need to mill me out here, um, and I haven't been close to dying to mill either, which is uh, at least not in this game, which is part of the reason that I have to 
kill my opponent's elephant in Frostwalla and just make sure I don't die to the board. Um, and I do play that Marasa Behemoth here, which is a big old 8-8, and hopefully means the opponent's going to stop attacking me. Though, unfortunately for me, there's another Winter's Rest. And this means that um, now comes a big attack here for 9. We fall down to 6. Um, I believe, yeah, I just get to jam a Kroos and Tusker, so that thing, which was rotting in my hand for a bit, is finally going to do something now. And the opponent here... Interestingly, just goes for the attack with the uh, the Genesis, and I feel like it's like a pretty reasonable thing to just attack with all the creatures here. I mean, I'm just so close to dying already that uh, any blocks are pretty good for you. But um, yeah, we do try to eat the Genesis with our Cross and Tusker. It seems like it's going to work. We get milled for a couple, and we get milled for four more, and suddenly. <laughs> It doesn't matter that we're down to six life because we're also down to eight cards in library, and that means we're getting decked pretty fast here. Draw a Trumpeting Herd, which is um, something we also fire off a Pyrophobia on the Elephant, which is going to give us an attack, which is something. Um, with the Elephant in play, there is a double block against the Kroos and Tusker, um, but it's just really not looking great at this point with so few cards in library for me. And the opponent has Mana War on an Elephant. We know that they have um, Snow Permanent in hand. They have that Frostwalla. And at this point, I think I just scooped. Um, let's see what my draw is here. Uh, yeah, so it looks like I did just end up scooping here, which I think is pretty reasonable with my opponent at 20. We know they have a Snow Permanent in hand, uh, which is going to mill me for four. They can just block... Um, that Kroos and Tusker with the Mana War, rebuy that, bounce my elephant again. Like, I'm never making progress on this board, so um, time to pack that in and go to game three. All right, here we are for game number three of my first match against LSV in this format. Um, and yeah, we have a pretty reasonable hand. A little bit awkward that we're missing double green, but there are some things we can do about that potentially. I decide not to lead on Forgotten Cave and not to cycle it um, because um, my thinking was if I draw like Forest exactly then I don't need to um, to keep the Forgotten Cave and then I can cycle it but since I didn't draw Forest now I just want to make sure I get to uh, three lands with that Alpine Guide in my hand and with the Kroos and Tusker. And so we'll just fetch up a snow mountain here with our alpine guide and praying for a forest off the top at this point for the trumpeting herd. Run up with a pretty slow start over there. Cycle unearth and to not do anything. And thankfully we do find this forest. So now we get to um, go ahead and attack for three and deploy a trumpeting herd first of two. We don't want to play the anorid because even though it is a little bit more mana efficient, uh, it only puts four power onto the battlefield as opposed to six. Um, the Cancrix here is pretty annoying because it does um, just take one of the attackers effectively off the table, but we get to play another trumpeting herd here, and now it's starting to look like we have a real clock against uh, the opponent who is not uh, getting there in quite as aggressive of a fashion. Um, and now, so I think this turn what happened is I cycled Kroos and Tusker to start, and then I think this is the turn where I probably made the biggest mistake. Um, or wait, no, 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 okay. Looks like I didn't cycle Kroos and Tusker. That's good. Um, so it looks like, yeah, I played the Anorid here, which is fine. Um, and my plan was I was going to have Sinkhole up, uh, and be able to hit the Genesis. Um, but I drew Pyrophobia, and I think this is where, yeah, if I had just done things differently, I probably would have been fine. Um, but what happened was, if you recall, in game one, I almost lost to the Spore Frog uh, Genesis combo. So my thinking is, I have so few ways to disrupt that combo, I just have the two Magmatic Sinkholes and the Lava Dart, um, that if I can use Instant Speed Removal uh, or keep instant speed removal in hand to disrupt that combo, then I should. Um, and therefore, I ended up going for this attack where I sent all my creatures in, and then I used the uh, Pyrophobia post-combat, whereas if I do things the other way, I sinkhole pre-combat, 
I send all my creatures, uh, the opponent takes nine damage, and they need like exactly Spore Frog, pretty much, or they lose. Um, and so this was pretty frustrating for me to realize in hindsight. Um, at the time, it just seemed like I was making a fine play, and I had all these uh, bodies on the battlefield, and you know, there's like nothing that can go wrong. Um, or it feels like that because I have, again, so much board presence. But the opponent's going to start milling me really fast. Yeah, so they had a lot of mill triggers this turn, but uh, they ended up targeting uh, themselves with a bunch of them, uh, presumably hoping to find Spore Frog for the Genesis, kind of desperately looking for it. Um, and of course, I do have the Sinkhole in hand. Um, at this point, I get to cycle the, the Crows and Tuskers, see if I find something cheap. Sadly, I don't. Send in the three threes. Opponent chumps with the Rhyme Tender, bounces off with the Crabs. Um, and they are back to milling me. And Mana War comes down, and Mana War Genesis is just absolutely brutal against me because it means that all my three threes are, <laughs> are just going to die here. Um, and the opponent has Ephemerate, and now I'm forced to burn my Magmatic Sinkhole, which is pretty unfortunate for me because now it means the same Spore Frog um, combo that I was trying to um, make sure I was live against earlier uh, is now a huge problem for me. The opponent has this Abominable Tree Folk, um, and we're getting milled out really, really fast. Uh, and so I draw this Dash creature, which does make it seem like I have some hope. The opponent blocks, blocks, blocks. Um, so we deal them three damage. Now if I draw a Lava Dart, they lose. Um, the opponent gets back something with Genesis. And there's the Mana War. I think that's what they got back, though I'm not sure. And yeah, I'm just never winning on this board. Um, I think they might have gotten back a Snow Permanent. I don't really remember. Yeah, so I just go for this attack, which does not accomplish anything, of course. And the opponent just needs to play any Snow Permanent here for me to die because I have four cards in library. And that means that even though one of those four cards is the Lava Dart, I can only flash it back, um, which would deal them one damage um, as opposed to the two I needed to kill them. And so we never did get hit by the uh, Spore Frog here. And if I just uh, went for the uh, Magmatic Sinkhole pre-combat instead of the Pyrophobia post-combat, we would have been totally fine here. Um, but yeah, the reason that I made that play ultimately is because I think I was really nervous throughout this match, uh, thinking about, oh my gosh, I'm playing one of the, you know, top three players of all time, whatever, whatever you want to rate him. Um, and it's not something you do every day. I knew he was streaming at the time. So there were a bunch of people watching. Um, and yeah, I just, I gave him a little bit too much credit. No reason for me to give him credit for the Spore Frog. I knew that I would be in rough shape against it if he if he had it. Um, but yeah, I just, I gave him credit where I didn't need to and kind of paid the price for it. So now moving on to um, our second match, let's see if uh, things change for me at all. All right, and here we are for game one of my second match this season of MH1 against LSB. I mulligan the first hand. The first hand is not something that... Um, that I would typically mulligan, but just thinking, well, my opponent's really good. Um, this limited format can be faster than most. Uh, I just wanna, you know, and try to ensure I have a good curve here. And I'm gonna get rid of this Nether Spirit uh, on the mulligan, and then I'm actually just gonna board it out after this. It's a card that I ended up uh, kind of regretting um, having in my deck. So once again, LSV is gonna start off with kind of a dirtily start here. I'm playing 2-drop into 3-drop. He's playing 2-mana um, card that doesn't affect the board into 3-mana 1-1. One, one. Um, so this is nice for me. Since I am playing a pretty aggressive deck, it means that I do get to attack here. Um, unfortunate that I didn't hit land 4 on time for the, gob the Goblin War Party. Um, but the good news for me is Firebolt on the Hellraiser means that I don't have to pay Echo. So now if I do draw land, then I can... Uh, play my four mana card though. He did splice a uh, Phyrexian golem onto that firebolt, which is not great for me <laughs> All right, and unfortunately for me here, I do not draw a land um, 
so I just have to sack my putrid goblin for the first time, put my opponent to eight. LSV is gonna go for an Aria of Flame. Not loving my spot here. This time I am gonna draw a land. Um, I go for this sack, and now I'm just going to play Goblin War Party um, post combat. Everdream is gonna happen, so just drawing a card here, dinging me for one damage. Um, and then here, I believe I go for that same play of attack first and then sack, try to play around any effect that like taps the thing or something like that. Uh, and string of disappearances is gonna happen, so the dragon heart's gonna go back to my hand. Um, but when you sack something, the dragon heart, it gains haste, so no reason for me to play it out right now, at least it seems like. Um, so instead I'm gonna play a war party, and now I'll play the dragon heart but unfortunately for me, my opponent has Exclude, and I believe it's Exclude that comes with a 3-3 Golem. Yeah, so this Aria is starting to put in some work. Uh, we're up against a lot of board presence here. I'm going to fire off one of my Sinkholes, <laughs> and we get to go for this attack. Attack with five creatures, opponent has three blockers. And I think I have a Lava Dart that I can draw to. Basically, the reason I'm making this play is because I think my chances are pretty terrible. I think I also have other dragon hearts that I can draw. Uh, Hellraiser potentially kills my opponent, so I do have a number of draws here that, that do the trick, uh, unless my opponent has some kind of counter spell or something like that, but the opponent does actually just kill me here. Um, so Splicer's skill uh, with that many verse counters on Aria and two 3-3s three that are not summoning sick is just going to kill me here. So moving on to game number two. All right, here we are for game number two of my second match against LSV in MH1. And this is banger of a hand, so another two drop into three drop hand, but this time I have Mob and Firebolt, and it's a seven card hand. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and lead on that Putrid Goblin, and then I'm just going to play Dragonheart here, opponents on Forest Forest, which is really not a great start from them. But there's that Spring Bloom Druid once again. Uh, we don't draw land here, but fortunately with this hand we don't really need one. Just get to play another Dragon Heart. Opponent plays a Fountain of Vicar, and there's Twin Silk Spider, which is a little bit annoying. Not the end of the world. It's not an amazing blocker versus my board. Um, and I just get to send with everything here. Looks like the Spring Bloom is just going to chump one of the Bow Gardens. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I do pay the Echo here. Uh, we find a Mountain, which is excellent for me. Um, yeah, it looks like I decide to leave my Hellraiser back, and this is going to allow me to pay um, or cast Mob here if I want to. Three lands untapped plus two creatures. And the opponent goes for, don't remember what this is, looks like Everdream with Splicer's skill on there. Um, and the opponent goes for this double block, and I think at this point I just get to, um, yeah, cast that Mob that I was talking about. So we get to get that Golem out of there and turn the Spider block into a Chump opponent down to eight life now and there's a pondering mage so presumably still some kind of action up here um, and yeah now the nice thing about this is I'm not attacking with the putrid goblin not attacking with the hellraiser and I am fairly likely to want to sack either or both of them um, so I get to leave just firebolt mana up here go for um, the feaster, which the opponent is going to exclude, but now I get to firebolt targeting that twin silk and just sack two creatures here, and my bow gardens are going to finish the job. So, moving on to game number three. All right, here we are for game number three. Kind of a clunky hand. We have three two drops, two five drops, one land of each color. Um, I believe I did end up keeping this. Opponent has turn one suspend crashing footfalls, a little bit reminiscent of uh, the first match maybe where I had that. So the nice thing here is um, we do have a bunch of cheap plays. The thing that's a little bit less nice is I'm choked on red mana right now, um, but I don't have any three drops coming, which means now is a great time to deploy the first Hellraiser uh, because then after paying Echo, I can still cast a Putrid Goblin next turn. And that is exactly what I'm gonna do. And the opponent has a Fountain of Vicar, and yeah, it looks like here I just went for the Goblin War Party, which is fine. Um, opponent is now going to be crashing into play um, with some Rhinos, and at this point, yeah, I just need to try to deploy a bunch of blockers. 
Um, unfortunately, can't really attack into my opponent's board, but just hoping that like eventually if I find land five, I have a pretty juicy setup for these scavengers. So right now, first I'm just gonna go for a couple double blocks. Um, we'll block the same pair of creatures onto each rhino, so there isn't like an obviously favorable way to disrupt the, the double blocks for the opponent. It's not super likely that they have a card that can mess up both double blocks. Also unclear whether I should be throwing goblin tokens on there in addition, but I figure there's not really a reason to do that. Um, and yeah, opponent bounces their twin silk spider, blows out one of the double blocks. Um, both hellraisers die, so I don't have to pay any echo or anything. Once again, the opponent kind of letting me get off easy in that regard. And we do find land five here for the scavenger. So we sack something. Looks like the Putrid Goblin. Get to attack with a 3-4 haste. The opponent has a bunch of 1-2s with reach, but doesn't quite have 4 power across them, which means this is still a fine attack for us. Opponent attacks for just 4 here, nothing else entering the red zone. And yeah, I think at this point, yeah, I decided to just play another scavenger. Uh, I think I sacked a goblin token for this, and now both scavengers grow. They do work pretty nicely together. Um, don't really remember what happened here. Oh yeah, opponent just goes for a weather the storm, which is interesting. And then here, I think I was considering chump blocking this fountain of vicar and or Icor, and then I decided I was just going to double block this one two spider token, take seven damage. Um, even if the double block goes poorly, my scavengers are going to grow. Um, opponent's a twelve life, and things should be looking good for me. Opponent now goes for the spring bloom druid. Um, and so I do have to worry a little bit about possibly taking lethal damage out of nowhere. Um, but at the same time, I get to jam a bunch of powerful attackers um, this combat. So I play my Dragon Heart, which as we know, gains haste when you sack something. Um, and so this is the last um, turn here. And this is a really, really interesting sequence. So I just kind of did this and figured that I was going to survive because I have two blockers back um, and my opponent's going to have to cash in a bunch of uh, their board just to stay alive at this point. There's no weather the storm for zero mana in the format. Um, so that's what's going on here. Um, but I should have actually done the math. <laughs> I should have made sure that um, I wasn't just going to be dead. So let's say, for instance, I use a 1-1 one -one to block uh, the opponent's 3-3. Uh, well, then at that point, the most damage I can actually prevent with another 1-1 one, one is only one, right? I can block here, prevent a damage, or here, or here. Um, unfortunately, Trample makes it pretty annoying for me. Um, but the good news is I didn't quite leave myself dead because, um, you know, I am attacking for enough damage here that I am going to force some blocks. Um, but just the kind of thing where, again, just a little bit nervous going through the motions too quickly. Um, and kind of the same note here, so the opponent just blocks this 6-7, right? And so I this is where I'm like, oh no, like did I did I kill myself? Did I leave myself dead on board? And the answer of course is no, because there uh, there's just six power of attackers here. Um, assuming that I get to block there, um, and if I want I can even throw this thing away. But I decide, you know what? Um, this is my second match against LSV. Uh, this time, instead of being 1-0 paired against him at 2-0, uh, this time I am 2-0. This is game three of my finals. I'm going to see if I can win this game. And sure enough, um, I actually can. So this thing has five power right now. Uh, opponent's taking four damage no matter what. So all I have to do is grow this to eight power, uh, and I win. And so what that means is even though Bogard and Dragonheart is not going to continue to grow if I keep sacking things, uh, the scavenger is. So I just sack my uh, goblin here, goblin token, and my other scavenger opponent is going to take exactly 12 and die. Um, so some nice matches. Um, the reason that I showed you all uh, these matches um, is because I feel like I learned a pretty important lesson from playing them. So in that first match you might recall uh, maybe agonizing a little bit on my part um, that if I had played uh, that delve removal spell pre-combat instead of the pyrophobia post-combat um, it would have been like a winning game for me um, and the mistake that I made was uh, giving my opponent too much credit right 
uh, if I had just been playing against like, I don't know, your run of the mill Magic Online opponent instead of like top three player of all time or something like that, I probably wouldn't have decided that I need to play around Spore Frog. Um, and similarly here, um, I'm like wondering like, you know, did he really, did he leave himself down on board? Like, you know, why didn't he, like, there's another spider token right there. Like, why, why didn't that block my, my scavenger? What I got from this was a reminder that, like, you know, you might be playing against the top three player of all time, but that person is still a person. They're still going to make mistakes. They're still going to leave themselves dead on board some of the time. And they are sometimes not going to have the things you think they have. They're not always going to have that spore frog. Um, and this is already something I was aware of kind of conceptually or abstractly. Um, but it's just, it's very different to accept that, um, you know, someone who's really excellent uh, at something, someone you have a lot of respect for, um, is actually still a person and capable of losing <laughs> and making mistakes um, in the abstract uh, versus kind of accepting that thing in game when you're paired against them when you know a thousand plus people are watching you on stream something like that so yeah hopefully um there were some helpful takeaways there for you all if not uh just a couple entertaining matches i played against uh, obviously pretty well known and and strong player uh and yeah hope you enjoy them see you next time